Welcome to Outdoor Addictions Podcast. We talk about everything outdoor related, real estate, and hope everybody's doing well. Chris, how you doing, man? Man, it's my first time in the booth, and how long? How long has it been? It's been a while. It's been probably a- since Thanksgiving. Thank been that long. It's been that long, man. Yeah. You've been out of pocket. You know? <laughs> some for good reasons, and some for bad reasons. <laughs> um, just back to be, good to be back in a dungeon is what I call it. Yeah, there you go. Dark and kind of dark in here. We yeah. we trying to videotape this one, so we've got the little lights on, yeah. give a little accent, yeah. make Chris look listen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's already <laughs> hot in here. It's oh, January twelfth, yeah. and it's ninety six degrees outside. Uh, I know. Well, it like it. Yeah, and it's gonna be twenty tonight or twenty eight tonight. Yeah, it's gonna be cold. Yeah. Cold front's coming through. You be in a deer stand? Ah, <sighs> not too much. I went. Yeah, I've been a little bit, man. I. I got to go with uh, Johnny Bass out to Illinois, and uh, we had a great trip, but we did not see the deer yeah. we thought we'd see. It's somehow those out-of-state trips, either they work or they don't. That's right. And uh, I know one thing, them basses don't ever invite me anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they do it. Listen, listen, there's only one of us invite you anywhere, and that's Johnny. So yeah. don't talk to him. <laughs> the other one don't travel that often. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> We have with us today, Casey Bass. Casey, how are you, man? All pretty good. Happy to be back. Y'all invite me back every couple of months. Y'all yeah, like me, but not too much. No, we want you back, man. <laughs> we want you back. You are actually a official sponsor of our radio the show. Radio yeah, show. that's right. Mm-hmm. So nice. we're glad to have you. And a dog you, catcher, right? <laughs> something like that. Oh, oh something along the line. Something yeah. along the line. Something to do with dogs. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But yeah, we're uh, glad to have Casey on board. He owns Twin Magnolia Ken- um, Kennels. 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 There, there, you, there, there you go. Yeah. Twin Magnolia Kennels. That's right. So, um, so Casey, tell us a little bit about your business, what you do, and and we'll go from there. All right. So, well, what? <clears throat> well, I specialize in German short-haired pointers. Now, you have a lot of different dog breeds that people work with in the in the hunting uh, sector, and a lot of different. A lot of different breeds are enjoyable to work with. You know, around here we have a lot of people that like uh, retrievers and labs and that sort of stuff. And but I personally work with the pointers. I, I'm one of the very few people in Mississippi that work with them. You know, on the scale that I do, and we're getting bigger every year. I'm trying to get better at it all the time. And uh, here you don't have many pointers traditionally, just as their name implies, or upland bird hunters. You know, right. they're used to hunt quail and pheasant and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. And uh, our bobwhite quail populations aren't what they used to be, but mm-hmm. in fact, you look, you you ask most people what a German short hair pointer is, they have no clue. But they, you know, you can show a lot of older folks, you know, what oh, they yeah. are, and they automatically know what it is. Right. They used to work with them when they were young. Yeah, when you when you say it's a it's a bird dog, then of course they yeah. they, they register that. Yeah, oh right. yeah, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that but. yeah, they start getting the idea pretty fast. But that's what I work with at Twin Magnolia and. Uh, we're going into our second year here uh, in, in operation. We're based out of Brookhaven right here, beautiful little town. Chris and uh, Bruce here, they might have some real estate here they could save. That's you, right. Uh, yeah. Just depends. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we're based out of Brookhaven here and we, we enjoy it. And I work with them, like I say, second year dealing with them. I have a couple females, a male dog. I don't do any training, but we can sort you out with some trainers located locally here uh, in the Brookhaven area. And uh, if so you, you breed them. Yes, well, I, I, I breed them. Twin Magnolia Kennels is a breeding kennel. And uh, like I say, second year working with the pointers as adults. Uh, we haven't had many litters yet. I got to do a better job this year working with them and doing doing right by them so that I do have a couple litters from now, them. Go into detail about how you work with them to get them to make some litters. <laughs> well, that, that all just depends. Now, that's I mean, do you go out to, to, the, to the kennels and light a candle and turn on some well, you, know, you, well, you, you, you don't want to light candles around them. So they may not like that one too much. But, uh, but there's, you got to get them into the mood. You know, there, there's a lot of things you can do. You can do it with dogs these days. Right. On a serious note, there's a oh, lot of yeah. things you can 
can do, you know, to to help them along and, you know, work with them and right. just provide them with the environment, you know, right. alone. Well, that's what I was going to say. Knowing your females and the environment and their cycles and everything is obviously a massive part of it. It is. Yeah. The cycle, cycling with your females, knowing the signals your males give you whenever a female is coming right. in heat, you know, all that good stuff. And, you know, the environment you, you, you place them in, you know, making sure that they have all the essentials that they need to feel comfortable producing a litter of puppies. Right. Because while... It's important to know your heat cycles, you know, that can be heavily infect, uh, affected by the uh, conditions that they're in, you know, the food that you're feeding them alone can keep a female from uh, from coming into heat, right. you know, on, on a regular schedule or not. Or, or the stress that she's experiencing, the outside factors and all stress, that. Stress, temperature, food food and nutrition is probably the biggest one, but yeah, there, there's a hundred different factors, 101 right. that go into it overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, so most people, like you said, may not know what a German short hair, short hair point, pointer is. We know it as a bird dog, but I guess my question is, do they make good pets? They can. Uh, the pointers, I'll tell you, the honest truth about them is that you have to have enough time and energy to work with oh, them. Oh, yeah, I was going to say. The, 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 they don't make a good house pet that you sit down and walk away from, right. which no dog does, but there are some dogs that are much better yeah, at would, dealing with that situation. Yeah, I would imagine the, pointer. the, uh, the pointers are pretty high energy. Yeah, the, the, they probably need room to, the, they're, to move. They're incredibly high energy dogs, and uh, they're not high maintenance, but you do have to work with them on just about a daily right. basis. They're, they're very demanding dogs and that they they need a lot of your attention and a, and a lot of focus to deal with them. But the, if you give them that, they'll probably be one of the best dogs you can ever have. You're never going to tire them out. They, they do what they do incredibly well. They're very versatile animals and they make great house pets. They work well with families. You know, I have, I have a, uh, a niece essentially who uh, comes up and, you know, she loves to go out there and, you know, see them and work with them and all yeah. that good stuff. So they can be real gentle with children. and, and Oh, yeah. A any dog can, but pointers pointers do great with that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're, they're Any dog in general, if, if you train them well and you work with them right, you know, they can they can be made to work well with, in a yeah. family environment or as yeah. hunters. They can do a combination of both. They can do just about whatever you need them to That's do. That's right. That's right. But spending that time with them, I know, is important. We uh, I always wanted a German Shepherd. It's all the only dog I ever wanted. And uh, about six years ago, my wife's dog passed away. He was old, and so it was time for a new dog. And I was like, let's buy a German Shepherd. So we got one, and um, we, we did it right. I mean, we got him from a good breeder. We took him down to a guy and someone who trains um, down there. He spent a month with him. And I remember him telling us, you have got to spend time with this animal I mean, walking, running, playing, you can't just, I mean, you can't even just leave him in a yard. Right. You need to spend time with him. And, um, you know, we just put the, the leash on him and, he, and you could, like you said, walk him for miles and he's ready to play when he gets back. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, you can definitely see a difference in the dogs that you spend time with versus the dogs that you just fill the food bowls up as far as uh, yeah, yeah. their demeanor around you and your family. And, you know, we got him right when my oldest daughter was born. And, you know, he would sit next to her and just sit and lick her, you know. She fell off her bike or something. He would just run over there, but he wasn't just rambunctious and rowdy and whatever. So that's, right. you know, uh, the importance, again, of, of picking the right breeder and how they treat their dogs coming up. And, you know, mm -hmm. because the temperament comes from, you know, genetics. Oh, yeah. Well, there, there's many things that factor in, you know, based on the, the genetics and, and the way their, their parents' demeanors are and all that good stuff. There's there's many things. Just about everything is in some way or another affected by, right. by, the, by the lineage that your dogs have. That's, that's very true. Uh, whether you want a hunter or a house pet, you know, it's very important to understand and and value the lineage and where your dogs are coming from. That that's a very important part right. of it. And lot and you said a moment ago you were talking a little bit about you know you you guys did it right and you trained him well and all that good stuff. That plays into a, in a, in a big way as well. Whether you do it yourself or you find a, a talented trainer, we have an amazing trainer based out of Brookhaven right here. I work with her quite often, 
and uh, that that's an important part of, uh, right. of what you do is, is deciding and making a plan, <clears throat> having a plan before you even get a dog. Yeah, yeah. Ha- that's having the key. A plan all the <laughs> way right. through. That's the when key. you get there, and you're like, "What do I do now?" You're in a bad spot. Well, you're you're already behind. That's right. You're already behind. Dude. Yeah, and I tell you, it doesn't. When you pick, the, I don't care if your dog goes to a trainer for a month or three months. When you pick that animal up, it's not over with. No, no, it has to. Yeah, whatever they've learned, like you said yeah. earlier, you have to keep reinforcing that. That's Otherwise, exactly they right. just forget it. That's it's, right. I mean, I can, it, it, it hit just right when he came out of school. My wife's a teacher, so we were going into the summer. So every day she would go out there and she would run through some techniques with him, whether it was stay, you know, whatever. And then she would just spend the time with him. But you've just got to keep reinforcing that. It doesn't stop. It is. A, a trainer lays the foundation for that dog's life right. of, 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 like you say, just, just the, he lays the foundation for, you know, everything that that dog can do, but you have to be the one to continue to work with him or her and, you know, get everything, continue to build upon what that trainer did for you and that dog. And that, and some dogs are, are better, better to be trained than others. You know, some dogs right. are, I, I tell people all the time, and this is a big difference in dogs. And any dog can be trained, theoretically, but uh, m- the difference between male and female dogs, male dogs are much easier to train the vast majority of the time than female dogs. Man, that's the, the real life, too. It, 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 <laughs> it just about works the same no matter what you say. You said that. that you're you're laugh, so the doctor can hear it. That's right. But yeah, that that does that makes a big difference in a lot of things throughout a dog's life. Right, it's, you know, and that goes back to making a plan before you even think about getting a dog. I wonder, I wonder why that forward. is. Why is it females are are harder to train than male? Or? Males tend to be intris- intrinsically linked with pleasing you. Right now, that that generally comes from the fact that you know males follow a strict hierarchy you know, in, in their natural environments. And yeah, so, someone's in charge. And someone's in charge. Makes sense. And they, that, that individual that's in charge, they, they like to please that individual. And that's where, a lot, that's where a lot of your things come from, whereas females, females, they couldn't care less about, you know, pleasing their, their owners generally. You know, it, it, it varies from person to person and dog to dog. But generally, females are much more uh, independent. Yeah. Males are dependent on attention. Females are independent of attention. Right. They can they can handle it and they 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 like it, but they don't need it like right. like male dogs do a lot of the time. Right. How do male dogs determine that hierarchy? I mean, is it age? Is it size? Is it? It's generally well, you know, in the wild, it's going to be whichever one's the toughest. Right. Now, yeah. now yeah, it, with wolves and whatever. Yeah. Now, now in. I'll tell you the honest truth. You know, your 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 dogs around the house. A lot of the time, it's whichever one's smartest. Right. Whichever one's smartest is the one that's going to be the boss because you know they may not have all the tools at their disposal as the wolves do. You know, to put people in that hierarchy. Right. Whereas you know your dogs run around the house. You know, they generally whichever one's the smartest is probably going to be your boss. And uh, age does play into it, like you say, but age is. Age is generally not as big of a factor as people might think. Dogs don't respect seniority yeah. like people do. Right. Yeah, yeah. They look at things very differently, obviously. They mm-hmm. do, so. <laughs> but yeah, that, their vision's in yeah, black and white. We don't walk around sniffing each other's butts to <laughs> no, kind of figure out what's going on. If we do, that, that, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Door, yeah. <laughs> but it is amazing that uh, the, the, the dogs can learn so much and really be able to function at a high level. It's pretty cool when you see a good retriever. And that's another question I wanted to ask. I mean, obviously a, a bird dog is good at pointing birds and then actually retrieving those birds. Have you found that they're really good retrievers in other sports such as duck hunting or maybe finding antlers or, you know, yeah, things like so that? Like, well, you, you brought up two things there that are good points. And uh, like you were saying, uh, so specialty in in the breed is you know an important part of it sure. Re- labs are made to be water waterfowl retrievers that's what they're bred to do they're Point- considered water dogs yeah po- po- pointers are, are are bred to be upland bird dogs right whereas you have some other breeds that you know specialize in blood b- blood trailing you have some dogs that specialize in hog hunting you know all that kind of stuff what you're breeding them for is an important part of, of that equation 
And, uh, but really, a dog can be trained to do just about anything. Yeah. And, you know, a, a pointer, for instance, you know, they can, they can be good waterfowl retrievers, but they're going to require a little bit of special care and treatment whenever they are, like labs. Labs can go out in the middle of Mississippi winter and be happy to go out there and, yeah. and pull ducks out of a pond yeah, all you, day. A pointer's not as fast. You put a different that cold breed. Water. Yeah, you put a different breed in that in that environment. Mm. They so can react differently. So you know that's important. Again, going back to understanding your dog. Right. You know, it's important that pointer is going to need a you know a, a, an over you know a, a dog coat. You know, right. an overcoat that's waterproof. You know, to keep him a little warmer than a retriever might need. Right. Whereas uh, you know retrievers. They don't do well working as in the high intensity jobs like the pointers do. Pointers, you can set them out in the mornings, you know, and they'll go all day walking with you, you know, doing exactly what you want them to do if they're trained well for upland bird. Whereas retrievers, they don't do as well in that, you know, consistent work. You know, retrievers are great, like labs, they're great at, at pulling ducks out of your spot, you know, occasionally. You know, they go out right. and do burst of energy. Whereas the pointers, they're working consistently all day. Endurance is a big difference. Slow the motion. I mean, I can only imagine that yeah, it makes sense. the strength it takes to just hold that all day. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. Do you, are you finding that there may be local people, I say local, right here in the southeastern part of the country, who may invest in a pointer? And obviously, we don't have the quail here like we did you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. But maybe these individuals will travel out of state and go to other states and hunt. Do you find that they take their dogs with them? And oh, absolutely. And you know, going back to what you were just saying about the southeast pointers. Whenever I first was looking to get into them about four years ago, you could not find a pointer breeder in the state I of Mississippi. You, yeah. you, you, you might have you might have had one or two. There's a man up in North Mississippi that has been doing it for a long time, and he's very good at what he does. But all my stock comes out of Alabama and Georgia because there was literally no one in the state of Mississippi that you could source dogs from for a program. And now, about the time that my first litter came in last year, I went and spoke to my vet. I have a very good relationship with my vet, Dr. Bob Watson, and them right down the road. And uh, he said, I've seen more pointers come through my, my mm -hmm. practice this year than I have in any year prior. And he's been doing that for, you know, 30 years now. And so they have they have skyrocketed in popularity in the south in the southeast specifically in the last few years. But there are certainly people that that go they'll leave here in the winter and they may do the whole circuit. You know they yeah. they may do the whole circuit up there, particularly in the, in the northwest. You know that's where a lot of the people go because they have a lot of upland bird. You know and the Dakotas, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, you know, yeah. those are all big states that truly still have great upland bird populations. Right. And where there's a lot of the the uh, the fields is sector, you know, or is specialized right. towards that part of the country. They're centralized yeah, that, in that part that of the part country. That part of the country looks like what our countryside looked like 50 years ago. Yeah. Still had a lot of fence roads. It still does. I remember a few years ago, I got to go to Kansas to whitetail hunt. And I couldn't get over how many pheasants and quail I saw. Mm -hmm. I mean, just walking out in this, you know, CRP grass, you jump these cubbies of quail. Right. So, yeah. I was like, man, this would be fun to come up here and hunt. Yeah, and you know, that, that goes into our land here has been, we don't have much natural ground anymore. Up mm -hmm. there, they have a lot of ground that is still fairly similar to the to the ecology that it was 200 years ago. And, and in some cases, they encourage that. They encourage oh, yeah. farmers oh, yeah. not to, you know, to put it in this a CRP program where they don't farm it for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That produces excellent habitat. And, and you're right, Mississippi, that's that's changed. Uh, and that's one thing that would be amazing to see. Tree growth? Back. I mean, tree planting and tree uh, growth? No, for, from what I understand, and Casey may know more about the history than I do, but uh, from what I understand, you know, when I was a kid growing up, um, there were a lot of, on our, on our family farm, there were just small fields, a lot of hedgerows, fence rows, well, over the course of time, people began to open up and create big pastures, big, big crop lands. And there was, you kind of took out those hedgerows and took out that environment, that habitat for quail. And so what happened was you just, they lost their habitat. They just lost it and they couldn't reproduce and, mm -hmm. and couldn't thrive like they once did. And this was within my lifetime and I'm, you know, I'm 58 years old. And I remember when I was a kid, there were a bunch of quail running around. Oh yeah, and you know, like you say, it's 
the habitat has changed drastically in the course of the last 50 years. And uh, here in Mississippi, particularly, you know, we don't, like you say, there used to be brush lines around fields all the time. You know, that's what, that's what it used to be. It's gotten exponentially easier to clear land this day and time or it, it, over the course of the last 50 years. So people began to clear their land and clear, clear, clear it, you know. Yeah, they, not, would, they would make it available to farm, it, it, yeah. exactly. to grow a crop. And, you know, or, and, you know two, we have, if you look around Southwest Mississippi, you're going to see plantation pine everywhere. You know, that's, that, that's what it is. And, but that wasn't the case necessarily 50 years no, ago. And, you know, when I, I would drive around with my grandmother all the time and, you know, she could point out, you know, places, all kinds of places that are planted in pine trees and were 30 years ago, back whenever pine timber, you know, skyrocketed in price, everybody thought it would stay that way. So everybody planted their pasture everybody land planted. in timber. <laughs> and, you know, she always said that was the worst decision a lot of people back then ever made because they didn't have the foresight to see that it wouldn't stay that way, you know. Our family farm the same way. I grew up on a 250 acre dairy farm mm -hmm. where most of it was either hay ground, pasture, or cornfields. And a lot of hedgerows and things like that. My daddy retired in the mid 1980s and turned half the farm into a pine plantation. And he did the same thing. He heard about all the, you know, all the news was, you know, that's the big thing is planting pine trees. And he knew that one day he'd be rich. Mm. Well, little did he know, it just didn't play out that way. Nowadays, not, you that's can't not to say, it. you know, pine. At one time, pine brought good money. It really did mm -hmm. uh, for a long oh, time. Yeah. But in the last uh, probably twenty years, mm. uh, that is not the case. And I know in Chris in real estate, we see this a lot. It used to be if you listed a tract of land that had twenty-five year old pine plantation, that meant it had some money on it, right? Mm -hmm. Right now in 2023, that's not necessarily right. the case. Well, people could make their investment based upon an immediate return of that's logging right. that timber. And, you know, they could have a, a safety net there. But like you said, now you're trying to, you know, you may have to put some into it as well. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, I can see that. I can see how the pine plantations uh, affected quail habitat. So It does because, you know, and we've talked about it before. We've talked about the conditions that are necessary for really anything to exist, whether it be turkey, you know, our, our turkey population here is not what it used to be. Then. It's, it's starting to decline too, across not just Mississippi, but across the South. Exactly. And that's, country. that's a, you know, pine plantation, you know, you look at that, it's not a conducive habitat for quail. Quail, quail and most of your wildlife need a mix of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And that stand of, of trees planted, you know, so far apart from each other in every direction for a hundred acres, you know, that is not conducive habitat for them or, or, or turkeys or a lot of your other wildlife. Yeah, I think for most fowl game like turkeys, quail, their habitat needs change as they grow. Mm -hmm. They're going to need a certain habitat for nesting, another habitat for brooding, and then of course when they get become adults, you need roosting habitat. Yeah. And that's why turkeys needs a variety of this hardwood open timber and grasslands and thickets and yeah. But you think about it, most properties aren't, aren't built that way. They're either one or the other. Right, mm -hmm. either pasture or, or pine. Yeah, it's like, an, and, and there's just a hard edge. There is no transition. Yeah. It's either pine and pasture. Right. Or, or it's pine and hardwood. There's no, mm -hmm. no transition. Whereas years ago, transitions were everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, there was, everything was feathered. The little edge of the road. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, uh, the creeks, weren't very wide, but it had a hardwood timber along the creeks. Mm. Well, at some point, Daddy was like, let's cut all that timber so we can make our fields bigger. But when you do that, now you affect an erosion, things yeah. like that. Nowadays, you can't do that. You can't cut timber off the creeks like you used to could years yeah. ago. And so uh, all that affects everything, right? It mm -hmm. just affects wildlife, affects everything. And, you know, we've seen, at least I see a lot of people, you know, you, you take – you can sit down with the right people and they'll have a conversation with you for two hours about how to recover a property for white-tailed deer. Right. But that focus is not shifted to the a lot of your other wildlife that are native to the area for whatever reason, because most people f prefer to hunt deer. But, you know, you, you have people that are building just dream properties. You know, they think about it. They think about all the everything from the topography of your land to what trees are planted where to what they're going to plant here as your ground crop this fall to here in the spring and that type of conservation effort for whatever reason you may be wanting to do it it'd be nice to see more of that happening 
for other species as well as the white-tailed deer and having a, an association like the deer do to right. encourage that type of repopulation right. of the right. landscape. And there are those who want to bring back the Bob White quail. Mm -hmm. I mean, they want to improve, and they do. They're, you know, you can do that through prescribed fires and things of that nature. So there are lots of properties across the Southeast and we tend to see it more in the Alabama, Georgia area. Yeah. For sure. And I don't know why, for some reason, it just hasn't really transitioned to the state of Mississippi. But there's no reason why it couldn't. It couldn't. It it's just going to take could. some time and effort and intentionality, really. And, you know, the thing with habitat is you hit a, a critical spot. There's an imaginary line there somewhere where below it, you don't have enough acreage of that type of habitat for a species to exist and thrive. Whereas just above that line, you have enough connected properties and enough corridors for those species to exist within for it to truly work well and for those species to thrive. It may, you, you can recover your 100 acre property, you know, to, the, to exactly what it used to be. You know, you could, re, you could recover it to the best of your ability, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Bob White quail are suddenly going to thrive on your property because 100 acres in the grand scheme of things it's is not, not a lot of land. No, it's not. So getting both yourself and your neighbors to work together to create these large areas, these corridors in between the areas and everything else for these species to thrive, that's where it really counts in terms of that's preserving right. the habitat or, or recreating the habitat. Yeah. Reversing what's already been done. Yeah. yeah. All right, so Casey, uh, just kind of switching gears. Do you, uh, do you know any history of the short hair pointers? How they like, where they came from? How it originated? They came from Germany. <laughs> well, well they hit the nail that's... on the head right there. He, yeah, yeah. I that, that takes my, talent. My part before <laughs> yeah, that, I came to the show. <laughs> that, see that? That, that uh, takes talent. I was right hoping there. you would ask that question because I was really. <laughs> he, he studied. He probably uh, had. Uh, you uh, have a you have a note from, sheet on the back uh, of your that's hand. The there. Only note on the sheet. Right there. <laughs> But yes, they, they do come out of Germany and the pointers, funnily enough, a lot of uh, back in the day over there in Europe and, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It crossed the, the line of, of nations, you know, France, Germany, it doesn't matter. A lot of your a lot of your dog breeds were specialized heavily towards one thing and your large what we today would call kennels were owned by your aristocracy, your aristocrats, your more wealthy people. Yeah, right. The common the, person didn't, didn't have yeah, access. The, to the middle like class that. didn't have access yeah. to, to uh, companionship hunting like, like with dogs. And uh, the pointers really came to being as dogs that were a bit more versatile to where you could own one dog and cover three or four different types of, you know, of huntsmanship, you know, whether that be bird hunting or, you know, tracking it makes or sense. anything else. Yeah. And that, that they're, they're one of the breeds that truly came together, a melting pot of a lot of different other things and came together to not necessarily specialize in one thing to be more decentralized in their purpose. Now here in North America, we have traditionally in the, over the course of the last 50 years, we've specialized them entirely towards upland bird hunting. You know, anytime you see anyone doing anything professionally with them, it's always quail or pheasant or, you know, some, some sure. type of upland upland stuff and that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the pointer you get couldn't be a good blood tracker, you know, or whatever else you were looking to do. You brought up one of the more niche things like antler hunting, mm -hmm. you know, that, that type of thing, you know, anything like that that a dog can That's do really before. growing in popularity, yeah, a lot of people. I, I've heard of that before, you know, you, I don't know many people around here that are doing it, but I know. No, I don't, I don't know why. I, I guess, I, I guess I know why, but I mean, how many shed antlers have you found, Chris, in, in Mississippi? I mean, I, I found two in my life in Mississippi. Yeah, that's about how many I found. Yeah. And I know they're out there. Yeah. But I swear it's hard. And it's probably because we have such thick habitat mm -hmm. compared yeah. to somewhere like Kansas or Illinois or right. somewhere like that. Where and one of them was just sitting out in the middle of a soybean field that had been, you know, harvested already. It was just laying there. And the other one was right on the bank of a big creek. I mean, half in the water and half in the sand. Really? Like those are the only two in my life. Yeah, the ones I have found uh, were either in a food plot. And I will tell you this quick story. When I first got in real estate, I had a guy from Louisiana call me about looking at a tract of land in Franklin County. And so I took my side. At that point, I bought a, had a brand new side by side, met him out there, and we loaded up and driving down a logging road. And we were around a corner and laying right in the middle of the road was this really nice, like a 10 point one side of a shed out there, laying right in the middle of the road. And we both just pulled up there and stopped and just looked at it. And he looked at me, he said, you put that there, didn't you? 
I said, no, sir. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't want it, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the chances of that that yeah. living laying around the middle of that road? Well, that's a good idea. I'm going to have to take some shit out before I show some problems. <laughs> you know, you done, you done put too many yeah, ideas in here. What kind of right? shit out looks like it's been cut with a saw? <laughs> <laughs> you done put too many ideas in here. <laughs> You know that fella, he kept the shed down there. He never did buy the property. Hey, that's I was like, dude, man, you should have left that with me. And it was a good one. I was a good deer, man, I swear. I have not had that happen before or since. I mean, wow. that's the first time that's ever happened. But mm. they must, uh, He must have heard you coming and bolted and it fell off. <laughs> yeah, may have. There you go. May have. All right, so Casey, you have another business. I do. Uh, well... I do a lot of different things. I do a lot of different things. I do a lot of different things. We don't particularly specialize well, all yeah, that well. They just specialize. Uh, That's all yeah. they do. <laughs> but along, alongside, the, uh, alongside the kennel, I also do a, do a good bit of woodworking. And I, I need to get back into that a little bit more than I have over the course of the last several months. But I do. And we could come back and talk about Because the woodworking plays in very well with a lot of your other uh, small time stuff and side jobs and everything that people yeah. can do and the woodworking also plays well into a, a local small town business aspect as well and so that's something that we can come back and talk about all day but uh, the, I do I, I woodwork a little bit uh, and I, I try and get better at it all the time. So what are some of the things you do? Yeah. Well you know woodworking I say the only thing that you could do more than woodworking in is, is welding. Welding is a bit is a bit higher class than woodworking, but woodworking's a lot easier, and uh, you can you can do just about whatever you want to. I can do just about whatever somebody wants to ask for, give them enough time and the resources. Uh, I I like to do things like uh, dog kennels because they play in very well with the other. Yeah, I've seen other, pictures of those, Chris. He does a good uh, job. Other him. half of my stuff, I really enjoy doing the uh, the dog kennels and. Recently, I've been trying to play around with uh, a few of the other little things like uh, dog bowl holders, you know, anything like that to tie into the to tie into the other side of, of, of what I do. Uh, but you can do anything. I've done several tables before, uh, shelving, you know, any of that good, good type of stuff. Uh, Let's see, what else? Uh, serving trays, you know, a lot of your smaller craft items that, you know, you could easily go and sell at a, at a local craft. And charcuterie boards. Something like that. Yeah. If you want to I try and pronounce it. If, yeah. yeah. if, if he wants to try and pronounce it. Wayne well, makes some things. It's char char uh, yeah, that's charcuterie board, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sweet. Sounds good. Well, Casey, we appreciate you being on the well, how can people find you if they yeah. want? Yeah, so, uh, well, the both you can reach me for whatever you'd like to do, or if you'd like to give me an idea for something I ought to be doing, just go ahead and call <laughs> the number, anything to talk to you. But 601 835 6330. That's the phone number for the kennel and the woodworking shop, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about anything you'd like to do now. Mm -hmm. Now, the woodworking stuff, uh, you know, there's a lot of people around that do it, and I won't say that I'm better than anybody else, but I tend to try and work with people as, as best yeah. I can. And, uh, you know, if, if y'all want to talk about the woodworking stuff a little more, have we reached the time yet? Or No, we keep talking. Yeah. You just, no, well, I, well, it's just I figured we hadn't reached the, the time yet. But no, anyway, we're good. Uh, yeah, but that, that's something that you see a lot of people do, and, uh, woodworking can evolve into a lot of different things. We don't have any carpenters left. I'm sure that's something you two know from dealing with, with homes yeah, and yep. stuff. We don't have a lot of carpenters left in, in Mississippi. Uh, it can also specialize into plenty of other things. You know, some people become incredibly talented furniture makers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's C cabinet makers. Ca uh, cabinetry. Cabinetry is its own beast. You know, cabinetry. I've actually seen a couple of pictures of some cabinets you've built, right? Yeah, I do. I do outdoor cabinets. I, that outdoor cabinets are a bit simpler, and they're also a bit more uh, my style. I do a lot of bulkier wood projects, you know, and yeah. stuff like that. And the the outdoor cabinets, I, I enjoy doing that type of stuff as well. Um, but cabinetry, it's its own beast. You know, the, the, the detail and, and fine work that has to go into cabinetry oh, is, is its me. own thing. We remodeled our kitchen and we spent the money for the kitchen cabinets. <laughs> I mean, 
But I tell you what, it is amazing how they can come measure yeah. and then build those cabinets off site and bring them in there. And then, yeah. for the most part, fits right in we there. We still right? got empty cabinets after two years. I said, said we have to have all this. I mean, <laughs> we start to just put regular stuff in them. You know? <laughs> Blow up mattress in your island cabinet. I mean, <laughs> you know, what is it for? That's had to happen. It. But yeah. you know what? That is a lost art, and a lot of people are not. A lot of young people are not getting into right. that business. Plumbing, cabinetry, you name rocking it. chairs. Oh you know gosh. those things. You can't yeah. find somebody. When you that. buy a piece of furniture now, it comes shipped to you, and you have to put it together, mm -hmm. and uh, which is the whole. I mean, I'm sure that it's creates a beast in itself. Oh my yeah. gosh! Believe me. And Put, the, putting things together on Christmas Eve is my pet <laughs> peeve. I hate that oh, God, for yeah, the most part. That's a good point, though, too. You know, it's there's a lot that can be done with just, you know, the more manual jobs like that, yeah. whether it be plumbing, an electrician, you know, a carpenter, anything like that, welders, all that good stuff. There's not a lot of people going back into it, especially your residential stuff. And it's creating a big void, as I'm sure you guys know oh, yeah, from dealing with real estate. Is. Yeah, we have people contact us and wanted, really what they want is they want to do a remodel job just and, and can't find anybody. I mean, right. it's hard. A lot of the contractors have booked up building new homes or or maybe they've got two or three other remodel jobs. And I mean, it's just hard to find someone who's available to do it. Yeah. Available, you don't have to go on a long waiting list, you know, all that good stuff. And it's... It is. It's it's truly creating a void in service, you know, around here, you know, where we need more plumbers, we need more electricians, we need more carpenters, you know, that's all stuff that uh, people yeah. listening may, you know, they you may need to hear that today, you know, if you were considering a decision, you know, you may want to look into that kind of stuff. I agree. Never know where life will take you. That's, that's right. That's a good good point. Well, Casey, right. thank you, man. No appreciate problem. you. So give us your number one more time. Six zero one. 601-835-6330. And that'll get you to the kennel or the woodworker. And you're you're available on social media? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a Facebook page for each of them. I'm not real active. I need to get better at that. Okay. Uh, I have I have a Facebook page for each of them, Twin Magnolia Woodworking or Twin Magnolia Kennels. You can find us there at, at either of those. Yep. All right. Good deal. Appreciate you. All right. Appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it was good to come talk to y'all again. So if you're listening today and you like the podcast, make sure you share and yeah. subscribe. Give us a good rating. Yeah, give, give us a, five a good star review. rating. Yeah. Good review and help us bump on up. There you go. So we're hopeful. We're, we're, we're excited for the new year, excited what's coming down the pike. And, and uh, Casey, thank you for being here. We'll have you back, man. Appreciate well, I, you. I appreciate it. I'd be happy to come back sometime. Yeah, bring us something. You made a little wooden. There you go. Us, you know, like a wooden something. He's talking about commission stuff. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank y'all. No problem. Dang.